Is this a good volume? Yes. 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 Um, so, first of all, thank you very much for having me here uh, this week. It's super exciting. And um, especially after Matilda and Ipo's extensive research to product, uh, projects on the topic of authenticity and heritage and preservation of all those things, I have to give a huge disclaimer that I am in no way qualified to actually discuss that topic at all. <laughs> because I think as a, as a principal, my work is kind of running the opposite away from that. Or at least I haven't had to really tackle it. Um, I think I'm, I'm very much trying to create very new things that don't reference uh, the past too much. Um, and I, yeah, I, I go towards machines and production and materials to, to try and create something new. Um, so just uh, as a quick intro, I, yeah, I, I work uh, in quite a few different fields um, and in different scales, but everything really stems from um, uh, yeah, a, a fascination for materials and how to process them and how to get something new out of them. And uh, I'm super restless, so I always uh, collaborate with material specialists and architects, fashion brands to keep things fresh and moving. Um, so again, not really looking to the preservation of the past, but trying to run ahead. Um, so on. On the topic of authenticity and heritage, I'm going to try and somehow relate it to what I'm doing. What I'm doing, but maybe on a on a yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll interpret it in a in a different way than has been before this evening. Um, so, I mean, I actually, it's a big a uh, big thing for me to be very authentic in my way of working, and I I don't want to be following trends or watching online Pinterest things. Um, I think that really clouds authenticity. I think you should get inspiration from everywhere else but where everyone else is getting it from. And I think uh, for me it's super important to really be like gripped by a material to want to dive deeper into the exploration of it. So I have like a super big fascination with glass and the um, the way of processing it. Um, I think the first, yeah, the, the first project I did with glass was my graduation project from Design Academy, and it was a table um, that could be both transparent and opaque, so that it could have a dual functionality for people that work at home. Um, and I think because it was an industrial design degree, it was very much related to the function of a, of a product. Um, but the real fascination within this project was how to how to push this existing um, foil that is used in architectural ways and laminate it in a, like a smaller scale and in a way where all the electrical components are completely invisible and it runs on a battery. And I think the, the main fascination with that was just also working with uh, this glass specialist and learning what kind of machines they have, and then seeing the opportunities in it, what, what else could be done on the, in a different way than what they're doing now. So that was like the start of a, a long-running collaboration with the glass company. And also, somewhere in the middle, I started um, collaborating with another designer, Ritva Nerva, and we did a, a mirror collection, which I think most people probably know me from, or, one of the projects that's sort of most out on the internet. Um, and our aim was really to, to yeah, see their machines and see their possibilities, how they, 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 they took super boring projects like bathroom walls and, um, and then being like, okay, what if, what if we do this a little bit different? What if we push the limits that the, the fattest piece of glass can be laminated and then cut or half mirrored? And, it was really an exploration of how to get the most interesting results from existing production processes. Um, and they then became, um, yeah, mirrors, but 
in a more artistic way. Uh, and then as the collaboration or the experiments get going with the glass company, I super lovely. <laughs> Um, then I had the awesome um, opportunity to work with OMA and actually Ipo and Francesco on, uh, on an architectural project utilizing the material experimentation that I'd been done before. Um, and this, this is amazing because then um, I think this also showed me that my way of working is not limited to a scale because material experimentations are one thing but they can become something um, small and artistic that demands its own attention, or it can become part of an interior where it communicates with all the other elements. So OMA had this amazing material library already going for the project, and then it was like a matter of you know, adding my touch to it. Um, and then it comes together as a whole, and, uh, and I think the authenticity of, of OMA staying very true to their original concept and me being or having a, a certain language and it doesn't compromise each other but instead it, it becomes something bigger is, is a really um, good way to work I feel. So each floor of the, of the jewelry store had a completely different feel to it within this tiny setting um, and a lot of different glass applications were used like on the ground floor what you see now it was glass laminated with aluminium, and all these processes that they don't already exist, which then also kind of proved to be a challenge within a project where you need to have certification and everyone needs to be 5,000% sure that it's gonna be lasting forever and when it's not proven to do anything. Um, so it's also kind of like a a rush to try and get through all those like no saying and, and get it done anyway. Um, and this was the top floor, which had like a really muted mirror uh, with a color fade um, wrapping the interior. And then like the next step was even bigger, again with OMA and then it being like a super permanent outside iconic entrance of, um, yeah, really becoming part of the exterior architecture. Um, so again, I think that's really nice that it can go from material experiments that are this big to something that is enormous. Um, and uh, and to, yeah, to, to really add to the experience of the space, because this is a space you walk into and it creates this infinity effect and the colors also add to this tunnel um, feel, um, and that it, it can become something that it hasn't been out uh, used as an uh, architectural exterior before. And then my second big love is resin. Um, and this is a bit different, and what I really like about working with resin is that it's much more tactile and I can do the experiments myself. Because with the, um, all the glass experiments, I am not a big water claim. And I, I, you know, this, the material asks for all these industrial processes that are done by a machine. Um, and you kind of have to wait until the process is finished to see what, what the outcome is. And with resin, it's much more instant and you get, it, it feels more like a, Something I, yeah, I can get my own hands dirty on as well. Um, so this was one of the first projects I did with resin, and it was um, about creating volumes that somehow they look very solid, but in fact they're not. And yeah, it's always about, uh, I guess most of my projects are, are static, but they feel like they're, when you move around them, that there's something non-static about them. And with these as well, it was really, like, I think the only thing that really makes this object, like, something that you want to look at a second time, is this glowing edges effect. And I think that those, like, little moments within, um, within any project is what makes it something that people want to look at again and are fascinated with. So that's what I really want to um, create and I hope to keep creating. Um, and then 
and this project is also an example of it kind of crossing, it can live both within a gallery setting and a commercial setting where um, fashion brands can use it as display objects. Um, and I think with any fascination, the longevity of it is to, when you keep pushing it and pushing it, which is what I am constantly doing. So the latest uh, in this series of cubes um, that I've done is using rest material in a massive mold and casting to create a composition that's sort of floating in this transparent box that weighs like 600 kilos. <laughs> and the, yeah, it's, the whole time it was really like, oh no, is it gonna work, is it gonna crack? And so I, I, I like this moment of flux as well where it's, it's not sure if it's gonna happen, but that means it's probably gonna be either really bad or really good, and that's also, I think, part of the design process. Um, and then I experimented a lot with light. Um, again, a continuation of, the, of how to work with resin and how to manipulate it. Um, and, and these, yeah, these were sort of investigations into how you can change um, the path of the light by adding another material, and in this case it was resin, and you can really you know, play with the transparency and opacity um, to either dim it or diffuse it, um, and yeah, again, like create this sort of interesting moment. Um, and like with all my other projects, I, I think it's one of the most important things that your collaborators and um, your craftsmen or your, your producers are like, you know, very close and also enthusiastic about projects as well. So I work with this guy in Rotterdam that's been doing it for his entire life and um, he gets super excited with every circle he has to make. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's like one of the most important things that you're, if you're authentically enthusiastic, then I think other people can also become authentically enthusiastic um, about projects. And then another continuation with the resin was, okay, if you have a, a line of light and when it goes into a material, it creates an interesting effect. What about if the line of light never leaves the material and how can you make the interesting effect happen all within um, the additional material? So this is when I started really experimenting with how to combine colors and changing the intensity on one end of an object and uh, to the opposite end. So this was a lighting collection um, I did for Victor Hunt Gallery. And here, every object has the same white neon, and it's all about how to change the way that that white neon shines through the resin to again change, uh, show something that is unexpected and where people are gonna be maybe like, is it in, on an angle, like what's going on? And I, I really hope to keep, yeah, triggering that kind of a, a reaction. And here it was uh, in the Boymans exhibition. And then again, introducing different materials to, to showcase certain moments that are not seen if you don't have light. So with this project, it was adding in more materials to, um, yeah, to, to show something unexpected. So then I was thinking really hard about heritage and have I come across it? Um, and actually I have. <laughs> so I just completed a project uh, in May, which was commissioned by uh, a new institute and the I Film Museum in Holland and the Dutch Film Fund. So every year they go to uh, Cannes Film Festival to have meetings with industry people. So normally this is actually the most boring commercial space with like some, a table and some chairs and a, a coffee machine in the corner. Um, and then this year they decided to, because of the 100 year anniversary of the Dutch design movement, the style, to use that as an excuse to 
ask me to do something, <laughs> no, to, to, to make something more than what they usually do with the space. And then I was lucky enough to be asked to be the person to design that. And this is really the first time that I had to think about someone else other than a client or a, a, a collaborator um, with the project. Because it, the whole project had to reference a design movement which has a lot of heritage and uh, cultural significance for Holland, but I think also for me because it's a design movement which is super abstracted with, uh, it's all about pure shapes and pure colors. Um, and I am super not someone that makes decorative objects and I'm always leaning towards very simple shapes. Um, and this has been a design movement that has been very inspirational for me. So I wanted to do it justice. Um, and the, so basically it's a Mondrian painting. And when you look at it from the front, there is a moment where uh, it looks really like a 2D image. Um, where all the lines come together and the color blocks, like the, the gradations of color fit together as like a solid color. And then as you move around the space, you notice that the, it's actually a three-dimensional volume and the color is pulled apart. Um, and then it creates these spaces where people can have meetings um, on furniture, which is also referencing the style. But I really wanted to, I kind of was quite strict with this project because I didn't want to change the, the proportions of the, the shapes from the painting because I felt that then it was not do, doing justice to the actual original painting. So it was really like one of the first times, I guess, where I couldn't be selfish and just be like, oh, I want to do it like this. It's like, no, it's, it's like a big weight. <laughs> um, but so that was like, a, a time where I had to think about heritage. And also in maybe a very different way, uh, also in, you know, in April this year, I was asked to create an installation in the Aesop store in Milan. And then it was really um, a matter of how the brand has a huge heritage. It may not be very old, but it's still they're very strict within their um, way of communicating to the world. So then I had to somehow fit into that as well, as staying authentic to my own way of working. So this again was really about researching, okay, um, what is super site-specific to Milan? There is the Vedovel Fountains, which is continuous water um, going, and so I wanted to do something with water, because that references like uh, healthcare and, and purity, which is what Esau was also um, communicating. So this was also not just like a, oh, I'll just do that project, but a very considered to fit within the heritage of the brand and the city that the, um, that the installation was in. And then, just to be more relevant to the week, um, because I, I obviously am doing a workshop here now, which has to reference uh, the area and um, and the, maybe the preservation of heritage or how, um, how this is communicated uh, in, in different ways. And I decided to focus on uh, what happens after an earthquake, because obviously there's been this like horrific earthquakes in Sicily which have destroyed complete towns. And then the reaction to that is either to um, build the city up again in the same footprint in the same site, or completely move the city away and leave sort of the ruins of the old city behind, or um, build up again on the ruins of the old city, but in you know in a new way. And I think the the decisions or have interesting um, uh, consequences, but also opportunities. So I'm and I'm a, I very much believe in finding opportunities in, in every you know moment or whatever. So I think it's very um, interesting what then has happened here in Syracuse with, for instance, the Gemolina town, which has been completely <coughs> moved and started again um, at a different site, which then actually has given opportunity for this amazing piece of art to be produced, which is um, 
uh, it's Alberto Burri who cast it on the original footprint of the city and preserving preserving the heritage of the uh, existing rows. Um, and then of course the decision how Syracuse is rebuilt, not staying within the, the restraints of the past and then it gave birth to this new Baroque movement. And then maybe on like a super personal level, well, I think I don't think I would be sitting here if it wasn't for the cultural um, preservation of heritage that is happening well, also in Rotterdam. Because as soon as I uh, finished studying, I got a studio in Rotterdam in a, a monumental building, which there was always plans to re um, uh, to renovate it and sell it as apartments, but in the meantime, because actually they didn't have any money to completely restore it um, to its original state, there was this moment in time where I could have my studio there for almost nothing, which meant that I could be very experimental and take bigger risks with my work so that I didn't have to think about my rent. So I think also this, um, this there's an opportunity in like the, more, the time it takes to actually for things to happen within cultural uh, or heritage and preservation, and when they finally do. So I moved out last year, which is when I was able to pay for a new space. I think it's it's I think it's played like kind of a big role in my life. So the images on the right uh, was the ceiling when I was sitting underneath it. <laughs> And actually, you don't really see it in these images, but it's like a really intricate, like angels holding mirrors and books, and and then there's just like a, a light cable running directly over their faces. Like people were very much not uh, respecting the the cultural um, significance of the ceiling until it had to be restored, and then these women came in and started like with little magnifying glasses scraping everything away and um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I, th I think another interesting example is um, the Christchurch Cathedral in New Zealand which was completely, well it was, it's very much like a, an icon of the city and then it was completely destroyed in the earthquake but also like what is, has happened here. And actually the church itself was very happy to just, you know, completely get rid of it and start again. But then the city was like, no, this is like very important for us and we have to rebuild it and um, yeah, it's an important landmark. So now there, there is um, this big legal battle, but in the meantime nothing happens and there needs to still be a church. So it also in a way this like moment in between has then given birth to this amazing new Catholic cathedral, which is like won a Pritzker Prize. Um, so I think that's, uh, yeah, I will end there. I think that's also kind of amazing that you can find these opportunities within the, the waiting time of the cultural, uh, uh, yeah, stuff. <laughs> Your work is is kind of intimidating me 
you know, that you intimidating me. <laughs> yeah, in a way. And um, so, but then, okay, trying to make a step further. Um, we could say that probably there is a kind of fascination for the undefined. That means uh, this kind of an abstraction that you apply in your uh, first researches and then the object themselves, how uh, they appear, how they manifest also the spaces themselves, uh, since always a kind of space for an interrogation, you call them moments or ever-changing moments or that, yeah, uh, very short moments again that change the perception of peace that means it changes the perception of that present moment or that space or that personal experience of this. So I was trying also during the lecture to say, okay, but what is this, you know, which is the, how can we I mean, enlarge the perception of the body of the world? And probably I think it could be connected with the manifestation of a question also. That is what normally brings people attention to hear or attention to yeah to listen or to just see the things or and fall in love with things, objects or spaces. I'm sorry, it's not a question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but is that true or well actually I think well, what I've noticed is people try to find all these meanings behind the work. Yeah. You know, like a lot of, like, what is the symbolism? Or, or like, <laughs> and there, there is none. It's yeah, but like, it's like to find references, and then I feel stupid. So I said, no, it's okay, but it's not that fun. No? I think I, I just don't want to make it too complicated. It's actually, my work is super simple. And I think that's why it's accessible and digestible for people. Yeah, but at the same time, I think it's very tough to, to stay in that simplicity. How do you deal with that? Do you say some no, or, I mean, how do you deal with the climate, or, I mean, in the process, in the process itself? How many no you have to tell to yourself? I mean, uh, to stay I think I just don't overthink and I don't overdesign. I, I don't actually allow myself enough time to overthink or overdesign. I think, yeah, as I said, I, I, I want to, um, I work quite fast and I, I have no concentration span. So maybe that is part of it, that it, it's, um, of course the experiments, they take time and refining them is a pain in the ass because it's, it takes forever. But then the design part doesn't play a role in it, that comes after and that can be very quick. Um, yeah. And I think also because I, I work with so many other people, or like architects or fashion houses that also have their own idea or their own little need and then for me it's very easy to be like okay there is a restriction but i still want to make it something special so it's this and okay. but then there is also the time of the working time I mean, the the producing time like with the residents you are doing that i mean you are producing the pieces not with my own time okay but there is like, a lot of other people working on that i think if, if i was making that i was I would be able to make like one every Yeah, but you started to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That means that you have in mo you have those moments in mind, but then you need a larger um, kind of working time to produce the piece. So how do you stay that in that moment? Do you know what I mean? Like the result is always giving you the the, the expected feedback had in mind or sometimes I think I can imagine what the outcome is going to be from the experiments which don't take as long yeah. and also like uh, what I was saying with the, the cube that is cast with lots of um, lots of off cuts inside of it 
there is a small model which only just works. So in theory it should work, but maybe not. And I think maybe like a, a fourth of the time it doesn't work. And you don't see that, but there's like super frustrations. And, but I, I feel like it's really important to, to allow yourself to make massive failures. And, uh, because otherwise there's no way to recreate something that doesn't already exist. Yeah, so we can, we can also say that frustration is part of simplicity. <laughs> Simple <laughs> frustration. <laughs> okay. Uh, in some interviews, you always um, talked about the connection with the nature and the fascination for the ever changing moments you are uh, in the mountain, of course, or I mean, looking at the sky, and you try to translate that serendipity of the nature into the object. Yeah, I think, um, well, I, so as I said before, I think it's really important to just live a life with like your eyes wide open and like see an opportunity or an inspiration in everything. And I still feel that nature actually has the most to offer because it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's ever changing. There is, there is light, there is clouds, there is the sea, there is reflections and I think those have been, for now anyway, a huge um, inspiration for the pieces that I make because then you can really create something that is is changing with natural light or artificial light. Um, but then, kind of in a contrast, using super artificial materials. Um, but uh, yeah, I think. I, for now, maybe for like the coming time, I still find inspiration in nature, so I, I think it will be Okay, I think you have a question. Of that process, it's 
crucial way of um, of change something or to or or to find another way of producing authenticity, even if in, even if in a world that for us for our notion of authenticity is not there, like industrial production itself. But so can we just close um, with what you are doing with the group here, with the workshop, because you are also uh, running the workshop here. I knew that you were working with a super new material for you that is wood. <laughs> and we are all very curious about and very confident. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, we, well, as a, um, I said before, the whole way of dealing with the aftermath of, of destruction, like how do you rebuild and in what way? Um, and also the question of authenticity within the collaboration, like how whose design is it when many hands, uh, when it passes through many hands? Um, and how can you leave your own uh, fingerprints on it? Right? So the, the plan for the workshop is, well today we went around the city and uh, really just um, analyzed different architectural elements and um, specified certain themes that we found. And then tomorrow, uh, with wood, we're gonna um, make an abstract sort of sculpture with, within those themes. Um, each student will make one sculpture, and then by the end of the day, another student will just completely destroy it. Um, and then the question is, how does the third student then reconstruct that sculpture? Does, and then it's more a question of how you choose to work, like do you stay true to the original idea? Do you do your own thing? So then by the end of it, we have a, a collection of of many different objects made by many different collaborations in a way. Kind of fun, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also curious because, uh, yeah, it's true, I'm not such a hero with wood, so uh, <laughs> and we'll see how it goes. All of us are very curious, and for you, the ones who are participating to the class of Sabina, please uh, take care about the process, the exchange, and the the authenticity that you can bring inside that project. I would say that we can also uh, conclude this evening. Thank you so much. A lot. <laughs>